three, two, one. Good enough. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I got a new, uh, I got an announcement to make here. Um, I have a new soundtrack coming out, a uh, new NES soundtrack for um, a game uh, called Venture Kid. And this is a game I actually made the soundtrack for two years ago, 2013. Um, but uh, it's been in a, sort of a development cycle post post me working on it um, that has extended the, uh, I guess, the release date for it. But it's finally ready to be uh, coming out uh, midway through January. Um, so what I wanted to do was, um, I wanted a little, uh, like, I wanted to do a walkthrough of the music I made for the game and how I made the music for the game. Um, and, uh, for those of you that know who I am and the, the type of music I usually make for games, um, I am known as Norn Rad on the internet, uh, in some circles, as a, a chiptune artist. And so what the soundtrack actually is, is a chiptune soundtrack made to sound like the authentic NES, uh, 8-bit, uh, sound chip. Um, so... A lot of people, uh, you know, if you hear certain sounds, you, you usually think 8-bit, but um, there's a lot that actually goes into making something sound authentically 8-bit, and uh, for all the purists out there, no, I'm not using Famitracker. Famitracker would be 100% legit. It could compile on an actual NES ROM. That's not what I did here. Um, what I did instead was I used ModPlug, and I actually made all of my instruments in Famitracker, so I made large sample libraries, that would sound uh, authentic, um, and the only reason I did that is because uh, ModPlug allows you to uh, bend the rules from a composition standpoint, and uh, because I can bend the rules, like uh, if you just notice right here, there's there's all the columns that you would have in a Nintendo track, um, your triangle wave, and I'll I'll go over this for for people that maybe don't know in a couple of minutes, but very start for for all you uh, NES heads out there, just so you know what the heck I'm. Why would I use ModPlug over FamiTracker? Um, so you can see I have a channel for my triangle, I have a channel for both square waves, but then why do I have two channels here for the kick and the snare, which are effectively my DPCM samples? The actual Nintendo used one channel, um, so when I'm writing music for Nintendo, um, just as a compositional aid, I like to have these as two separate columns so I can just see where the kick hits and where the snare hits, but what I do is... I just don't have them hit at the same time, and then that way I'm still following the Nintendo limitation of one channel for DPCM, but now I can visualize it better, and that's uh, that's kind of why I was using ModPlug over FamiTracker because although FamiTracker is authentic and it sounds more authentic, um, it makes it really hard to write music, especially if you're under a deadline for a project and uh, you just need to get your ideas down and you don't need this extra stuff making it difficult for you. It's perfect for hobbyists, though, perfect. And if FamiTracker was where it is now. Um, 10 years ago when I started making NES music, I'd have been in love with it. I'd have been the first, the first guy to, uh, to, uh, be professing my love for Famitracker. And even though I do profess my love for it now, it's a fantastic, it, you should not be doing it my way if you're making NES music now. You should be using the program called Famitracker. It's an amazing program for, uh, NES music creation. Um, so that brings me to, uh, why... Am I using ModPlug? Uh, that's that's kind of what I want to do with this video series because I think it might just be interesting for anyone uh, to see how you know how what you can do sometimes if you if you set yourself a, a certain goal or in my case uh, you could see it as a limitation and then how to work within that limitation to create something. Um, so a last last thing here, one of the things I like doing in ModPlug is uh, I add this auxiliary channel that is muted. It makes no sound, but if I need to copy and paste stuff. Um, for like dragging it around and stuff, I just uh, like if I wanted to make a big change to this column, um, I'll basically just select the whole column, copy and paste it over here, make all the changes, listen to it. If it sucks, I'll just bring it back over here. So a lot of little uh, things like that make working in ModPlug way quicker than uh, FamiTracker. Um, hmm. Uh, I think that's about the gist of it. Ness heads. If that's too much, if I'm if I'm veering too far off well worn territory here. Uh, I'm sorry, um, but, uh, for all the rest of you guys, or girls, uh, let's dive into, uh, what makes Nintendo music sound the way it does, and, uh, you know, how can you go about recreating that sound in any application, if you're, even if you're using Cubase or a modern DAW, um, 
these are techniques, if you know them, you can still apply them, and then you can start creating, uh, you don't even just have to make Nintendo music with it, you could do it with synths, or even vocals, uh, these effects apply everywhere, and they're, they're pretty gosh darn cool effects, um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the, um, uh, I guess all the sounds that the, that the Nintendo was capable of creating. Um, I made a little mock-up uh, project here so you can hear uh, the triangle wave as heard here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a triangle wave. Um, they call it a triangle wave because it looks like a triangle. Uh, let's get my ugly mug off the screen here. Boom. Um, so yeah, roughly looks like a triangle. Now, if you're ever wondering, um, why did it? Uh, okay, what is 8-bit? Um, how do you determine what is 8-bit? Well, you're looking at right here, sort of not a perfect triangle. You're looking at steps like... Um, if I can zoom in even closer, you can see it's not it's not perfect. They're like jagged lines. This represents like voltage going in in a digital uh, digital representation of voltage, anyways. Um, so you can see it's not a perfect line. It's got like it's got a little noise to it, and that's um, and then it's got big noise with these steps. And these steps are basically uh, you know your bits. The more bits you can have on your processor, like and I might be butchering this, but this is for the the lay person, which I am. I am a lay person, but I've spent enough time making Nintendo music that I know how it should sound. So you know you can accomplish anything if you set your mind to it. Um, okay, so um, uh, here's my arrow. Okay, so how many do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay, good. That all checks out. Um, so. When you're dealing with 8 bits, you're talking about a, uh, oh god, I don't even know how to explain it, but what 8 bit means is that you can only create so many steps here, and this is a, this is why when you're trying to create 8 bit music, like, it kind of matters, uh, what sample you're using. So, I'm, I went out of my way to make sure I, I used very, uh, true to the NES, uh, samples, so that's why I used Famitracker to, to create my own samples for this, um, so I basically recorded a ton of octaves of the the triangle wave so I could I could recreate my own sort of NES bass lines. So uh, and that's another thing. Um, the triangle wave more often than not here bring me back here. The triangle wave more often than not was used as the base in uh, a lot of Nintendo stuff. Though if you get some weird games like uh, Legend of Prince Valiant or Caesar's Palace, sometimes they would use the square wave or sorry, the uh, triangle wave as a lead. Um, and it usually had this weird, like, old Sierra PC game, or DOS, I don't even know, like, King's Quest, you think about, like, these weird shrill tones. Like, it makes a good lead sometimes, depending on what you're trying to do, because it does almost simulate a sine wave, which is, um, something that Nintendo couldn't do. But a sine wave is basically a triangle wave, only it doesn't have a point, it's a nice round curve. Um, and a sine wave is the most fundamental waveform, uh that exists in reality so it's uh it's not something people usually use musically unless they're they're going for a certain sound so sometimes that sound which is kind of flute like um sometimes that sound was needed and uh the nintendo composers would use it for leads but uh, the reason you didn't hear that much one of the ultimate my one of my favorite characteristics of nes music is the fact that a triangle uh a triangle wave on the nintendo uh had an, an unique quirk because we're dealing with this like pretty limited hardware and they couldn't do all this crazy crap. So um, although the square waves could have multiple volume levels, which I'll go into in a little bit, the triangle wave for whatever reason, and there is a reason, but I can't remember what it is, but the triangle wave for whatever reason could not have any volume variances. So it was either all the way on or all the way off. And this is something that when you're composing Nintendo music, if you start writing your music where... Uh, like, this is a, you can tell immediately if someone's like, hey, guys, I made an 8-bit song, like an NES 8-bit song. If you hear any volume gradients in the uh, triangle wave, you know it's not authentic. Um, certainly not authentic. It could it could be almost authentic, but it's definitely not authentic. So if you want to be authentic, you can start composing with this on-off method. And that might sound like a horrible limitation at first, but one of the good things about it is, uh, if you've ever made music before, um, you might notice sometimes the bass just, it takes over everything. And, uh, you know, in the in the industry 
or you know among composers you'll call that the mud it starts muddying up a track if there's too much or boom if there's too much bass in something it basically just never goes away and it, it ruins sort of all the dynamics of your song and on certain speakers it'll just be unlistening unlistening to a bull not my best um so one of the the benefits of having this on or off technique is that there's none of that sort of uh, tail. So if a bass goes boom and then it trails off, all that trail can't be there anymore. It's just boop, boop. So there's no, uh, there's none of that trail to sort of add to the, uh, you know, the fuzz or the uh, the mud. And so that's something you can immediately start doing in, uh, you know, if you're making any track, um, you can start looking at your bass. And a lot of people do this with their bass. So this might be old news to some people, but for other people, uh, or even non-composers, like this is how you start cleaning up your mix so it sounds good on every speaker because you don't need that trail for the bass always because the bass, um, it's not always audible with your ears, but it is audible in like an overall mix sort of sense. So this is basically just cleaning up things that don't need to be there. So what if I were to add a little... So what I'm adding here is uh, this little symbol in Mod Plug cuts off the sound. As soon as it hits it, so this is what I would do to simulate the uh, the bass uh, limitation of only having on or off. So you get this little punchiness, right? So when you start adding that into uh, faster bass lines, like let's let's get nuts here. Anyways, you get the idea. So when you start writing bass lines, like that's one of the things. Like NES bass lines are so goddamn good because they're all just like they're all over the place, but they're super fast and super punchy, and there's none of that trail, so it doesn't it doesn't like bog down your mix. Um, so uh, pro tip for all you composers out there, that's something you can do with synths um, uh, right away, or anything with a lot of bass, or anytime you want a punchy track. That's a just a sweet method that you can use. All right, I think I've gone into the detail about triangle wave. That's that's core number one um, of making NES music. You need to have that triangle wave like that if you're concerned with being authentic. If you're not, hey, you don't like sometimes you can trail them off. Sounds good, but not like an authentic NES. So it depends what you want to do. So, OK, after the triangle wave and sorry if I'm going fast here, I just don't want to lose anyone. I feel like if I slow down for a split second, I'm just going to lose people. They'll be like, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about, blah, 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 blah. Um, so the other uh, the other interesting thing about the Nintendo was every Nintendo track you've ever heard from Mario all the way to I don't know what's a late like Mega Man six or something. Um, they all had the same sound chip. So imagine if uh, every band in the 80s had to use the same synthesizer, which they almost did for a bit because of the Yamaha DX or, or even the Juno 106. But, um, you know, in the 80s, little sidebar here, I'll make it quick in the 80s. New synths came out all the time. Um, in the early 80s, they didn't even have MIDI capability, and for the extra noob out there, uh, MIDI is basically just a digital uh, language that lets uh, one synthesizer talk to another one. So once you can do that, you can start uh, basically writing notes uh, in what they call a sequencer. And so you can play them live, and it records all the notes into the sequencer, but then you can go back after and delete like wrong notes or change notes around. So MIDI was great for... Uh, you know, speeding up the composition process. But before MIDI came out in like 83 or 84 or whenever it became popular, um, those dudes had to just play the synthesizer. So it's a really weird time in music history where it's synthy. And what we think of when we think of synth is like electronic music, usually, especially in the 80s. So early 80s, you'd have synths where the guys had to play them live, guys and girls. Um, and uh, so imagine then if there was just one synth for all the 80s and it was like it wasn't just like eventually MIDI came out and eventually this other synth came out with FM synthesis and stuff you don't need to know about yet but I will do a video about sometime so imagine if everyone used the same synthesizer and it only had three presets so let's hear those three presets now and then I'll explain what they are after so preset one we'll call this the 12 uh, percent and I'll explain that after 12 percent Um, the 12%, uh, no, I'll go into the characters after. So that was 12%. Here's the 25%. This is preset number two for the NES. And 
and preset number three, 50%. Okay, so those are just raw tones, and I'll show you what they look like uh, here, like I did before. Okay, so the 12% looked like this, and they call it a square wave because it's roughly square, not because it's exactly square. You can actually, with digital uh, stuff now, make it exactly square, but that's not what the NES did. Like I said, I made these samples in FamiTracker um, because I wanted them to sound exactly authentic. So. When you start looking at how the NES makes a square wave, you can see that there's a little variation down here, and then there's a little variation up here, and it's not a perfect square. It's because it's being created on this cheap little synth, right? So it's uh, it's uh, it's got character, it's got flaws. Um, so what they they call this the 12% because um, roughly 12% of it is on the up. Uh, I can't remember what they call the middle part here. The I can't remember, but. Half of it is up, or 12% of it is up, and the rest of it is down. And this creates sort of what I would consider a nasally sound. So if you wanted to make a nasally riff, or if you had sort of this, um, you wanted something to have this quality, let me... So, one game right away that I would say this should be uh, reminding you of is Rygar. I think the whole game... Um, I think the entire game of Rygar used the 12% as the main composition tool. I don't know how to play it. Um, one of the weird things about trackers is that you play them on your actual typing keyboard, which is uh, a little hard to shred. Yeah. Or like uh, Game Genie. Wait. Anyways. I mean, that could look really cool, but there's a little delay, too, so it's not super fun to play. So that was the, uh, the 12% was basically your nasally thing, although it could also function as, like, a real sharp low note. So here's what that would sound like, a sharp low note. Let me turn this up. I need to hear this better. Like, right around here. So there's that. Um, you know, it could also uh, function as a, a brittle lead. Like if you do a nice swell, um, I found that the 12% the is a nice brittle lead as well. Uh, it also, for some reason, makes me think of like desert levels, even though I, I can't think of a game that used it for desert levels. But that's one of the, that's how it's a fun way to think about like the little difference here, um, like what how it was used and how it was utilized and, and the neat characteristics of it. Excuse me. Uh, how unprofessional. Oh, and look at me deleting things that I need. Hopefully that doesn't bite me in the butt. Nope. Okay. So that's 12%. Um, very, used somewhat sparingly, I think, uh, in the grand scheme of NES music. But now we're getting on to the uh, 25%, which looks like this. Like, really similar. It's not that much different than the last one. In fact, 12%. Looks like that, and 25% looks like that. Like, it's not a huge difference, right? Um, but basically what you're hearing is 25% of it is up, 75% of it is down. And alternately, they have a 75%, which you could consider as another preset, but it sounds exactly like this one when isolated on its own. Um, but, uh, you know, that that's maybe a more advanced thing. Um, sometimes they would use 75% for sound effects because then it wouldn't... Uh, it wouldn't be exactly what the uh, the twenty five percent one was doing, but you know that's a story for another time. So, oh, uh, it did remove it. Son of a gun! All right, let's uh, twenty eight. All right, fine. Okay, twenty five percent. Here's what we sound like. Right, you heard that before. So, 25%, you're thinking, what's the deal with that one? Um, this one, I think, is the, uh, what is, this one does all the heavy lifting for the NES. Um, a lot of people might think of 50% when they 
you know, like if you're uh, if you ever go onto your uh, YouTube on the YouTube, you know about it. If people type in like 8-bit remix or 8-bit, eh, they always use a 50% duty cycle, which is the one I'm, I'm getting to after this. So they use the, the preset of uh, the 50%. But um, most of the time when you think about NES music, especially the best NES music, a lot of it was done with the 25% duty cycle. So um, think about uh, Mega Man, Mega Man 3 intro or, or any uh, Mega Man 2, 3 or 4. All of them were just chock full of twenty-five uh, percent. So, like, here's a, a like a staple. Let's see. Okay, so. Damn it! I'm terrible at playing this typing keyboard. So something like that, playing a third uh, in like the Aeolian mode or, uh, you know, any 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 mode or scale that is uh, associated with the major scale. If you play a third, you're basically playing something that would fit in a Mega Man game. So that's pro tip number two. Um, if you want to sound like Mega Man, use a 25 percent duty cycle and uh, play a third, not a perfect third. You need to know a little music to know what I'm talking about, but a third in the scale. So whatever scale you're using. Bah, hit one note, then bah, bah, two notes away, basically a third. So um, that's how you can start sounding like uh, Mega Man. Or something like that, whatever. Um, but I mean, aside from that, um, I don't think that the 25% duty cycle often makes the best lead on its own. So you don't usually hear it as just the lead uh, but there's a lot of stuff you can do stuff that I might get into later in the video um, how you can make it a better lead but on its own when it's just used like this doesn't make the best lead but it makes for like really good background sort of like uh, you think about Castlevania 3 or something if you ever mute all the channels if you have that functionality um, use Winamp and uh, download a bunch of NSFs uh, that's that's for you to figure out on your own, but you can basically listen to NES music and mute all the channels So you just hear one of the square wave channels um, And you'll hear in Castlevania 3 that uh, you know the background channels not the one That's the lead that you think of when you hum a song the one that that is in the background because there's allowed two square waves There's usually one square waves kind of ha handling the lead uh, But then the other one is just going all over the place sometimes even hitting what sound like wrong notes, but they're just mixing perfectly um they're mixing perfectly to sort of create this lush sound. So the the twenty five percent duty cycle, it's the least offensive sounding square. So you can you can just load it. You can go all out. You can make echoes with it. You can you can do a little leads. You can do a little power chords. You can excuse me again. It's basically just a workhorse. It's the NES workhorse sound. Um. So uh, aside from that, we got the fifty uh, percent duty cycle. Uh huh. Fifty percent duty cycle. Um, it's kind of the best and the worst. Um, it's an extreme sound. Uh, so let's see what it looks like here. Zerp. Bonk. Okay, so fifty percent meaning half of it's up, half of it's down. Fifty percent. Um, what am I doing here? I'm blowing it. Okay, back we go. So the fifty percent duty cycle. I find this is just my taste personally. Makes the best lead. If you want to make a lead. Uh, for your song uh, in NES music, the 50%, it cuts through the mix. Like here, um, let's listen to... Let's listen to a little higher. The one problem with the 50% is it sounds... It's the best for leads because it cuts through the mix cleanly, but it sounds cheap. It sounds like a Sierra game or something. So the uh, the task then becomes how do you make it not sound cheap and I guess that's where I kind of want uh, this video series to go from here. Um, a lot of what I do when I'm making um, uh, bah, 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 adventure game files. I need to load up. Uh, 
mm, little title screen action, little teaser, little teaser trailer. So a lot of uh, what I'm going to be going over in this series is how you can take the the benefits, the inherent benefits of these sounds, but get rid of all that like, oh, it sounds the worst because it's the, the cheapest sounding. Like, how do you fix that? Vibrato, volume, um, adding echoes by hand, um, mixing them uh, together with uh, square or mixing the squares with the triangle in appropriate ways to sort of form chords for split seconds. Like a lot of times in NES composition, you just need to hit it really quick, but then immediately go to something else. But as long as you hit it at the right spot, it it uh, it serves its purpose and the listener is uh, able to follow along with what you're doing. So you want like rhythmic hooks. Um, you want to do it in sort of an intelligent way. Keep doing this for some reason. Hey, hey, hey. Okay. Um, but uh, let's see. The last thing before I get onto any music, uh, I guess I need to explain it visually or else it probably won't make sense. Probably won't make sense. Um, let's go to 45 here. Is that good? Okay. So like I said, I um, I used, wait, that's no good. What am I doing here? What the hell am I doing here? No, that was good for uh, pluck sounds. Well, anyways, while I'm here, instead of just having a raw tone like the ones I just showed you, these ones have a volume where uh, the first couple are a higher volume, as you can see here, and then it sustains at a lower volume. And the reason that I would make samples out of that uh, in Fami Tracker, like here's a good example, you can see the uh, a higher pitch one. But you can see um, if you do this in Fami Tracker and make the samples from it, um, you get a more authentic. Like, see how it cuts off? Well, you can't see me here. Let's get crazy. Where's my mouse? There it is. Right here, you can see that there's a. Uh, damn it! Oh yeah. That's something that the NES could do. It could cut something off in order to like stay on cycle or whatever. So that's one of the reasons why I would use the uh, Family Tracker to create these samples. And like I explained, I just like using ModPlug for composition reason. So what I'm trying to find here is uh, where you mix duty cycles. Uh, I just need to find a good instrument. Roller games, is that a good one? Yeah, that, yeah, that should be it. 42. Okay, yeah, this will do. So, one thing that Nintendo composers, uh, let me get my mug back up here. Hi, everyone. Nintendo composers, by the end of the 80s and the 90s, they started getting smart. Uh, what they did was, um, you know, to get around some of the cheap sounds, uh, what they would do um, is make it so the very first cycle is the 50%. You can see how it's halfway up here, clicking halfway up, halfway down. And then it would immediately go to the 12%. So what that does is it creates, uh, let's see here, how do I explain this? When you combine square waves, say you have two, because you have two square wave channels. If you combine both channels playing the same square wave, it'll uh, it'll basically just sound like a louder version of that square wave. So then if you, uh, if you mix it, so like one channel is playing the 50% duty cycle, and then the other one's playing, say, the 12%, they mix in another way, and sometimes that's a desirable way, especially Konami was doing this to make sort of power chord sounds. Um, something I'll go into with the series, not necessarily in this video. So um, sometimes you just want that initial pluck to sound like a 50% so that it mixes with something else in the song in the way you want, but then you want the sustain, the rest of it, to be a 12%. So what it sounds like then is uh, it's hard to even... It's You have to listen carefully here, everyone, but what I'm going to do... Create a new pattern. God, it's been so long since I worked in this. And now let's get to Aeolian. Okay, I'm going to just add a little volume here. You don't need to really know. Why? This is just so that it has a little more uh, pronounced start. I could copy and paste this, but I don't know. I kind of find it fun to uh, type them all out. Uh, wait. 16, 32, 28. Uh, that should be 
fine. And then, all right, whatever. So, here's your, uh, here's what it sounds like just by itself when you get this sort of weird duty cycle mixing thing where half the very first initial sound of it, the attack, sounds like a 50% duty cycle and the rest sounds like a 12%. So that was a very, very iconic thing that Konami started doing and uh, the rest of them followed suit. So almost every soundtrack for the NES that came out after 1990 had this sort of mixing of, uh, of duty cycles. And so one of the things that you can start doing with that is getting crazy. What's the uh, what's the one I got here? So I'm gonna mix a 50 percent, uh, 50 percent start to a 12 percent start with a 25 percent start and a 12 percent after. Sorry. Uh, so basically, the initial pluck for both of these is gonna have the mix of the 50 and the 25 percent. I might be mixing up what I'm saying, but look visually, the start of the one I'm adding is gonna be this, and uh, the start of this one is going to be this, so 50%. So when you mix these two mofos together, ba 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 what am I doing? 39. Okay. Same thing. Just don't worry about what I'm doing here. So you mix them together. really hear anything different, but what if I change the note? And then what if I make that a lower octave? Um, yeah, so those are basically all the techniques. Uh, there's more ones that I'll go over um, once I start getting into the, uh, the meat of the rest of the songs. But uh, thanks for sticking with me on this one. Um, that, that's the core basics. When you're trying to make Nintendo music, um, those are basically the things you want to try and do, um, as building blocks. And then you work from there and there's more I can show you, but, um, uh, the, the things that I need to show you after this are more just, uh, uh, techniques rather than limitations or, or things like that. Um, so yeah, um, I guess Stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to load up every song from uh, this upcoming Venture Kid soundtrack and I'm going to walk through them. I'm going to play them and then break down why I chose to do certain things. And uh, if you notice here, uh, like you don't have to know how ModPlug works, but basically this is your your pattern bar and this is every pattern in the song. So it goes from this one to this one to this one to this one. Ba 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 ba. But then you'll notice like there's a little gap here and there's gaps all over the place like over here as well. Um, these gaps, uh, the thing I also like about mod plug is that you can write patterns and then not want to use them and then basically just like slide them over, like say, get over there. I don't need you here anymore. And then, so you can sort of organize the, the direction of your song or the, uh, the song structure over here. And although family tracker can do that, I mean, I always feel like I'm picking on family tracker, but I'm not, what I'm doing is just trying to like justify to you, the listener, especially the nest heads that like family tracker why I continue to use uh, ModPlug even into this day and age when FamiTracker is king of NES sounds. Um, this is just way easier to use than the FamiTracker thing because, I mean, they have to account for, uh, you know, compiling on code and stuff. So I don't even know. That's just a nightmare to, to deal with. So, but here you just drag and drop. And so if I, uh, usually what I do is, oh man, you know, the end of this pattern, I don't know if I like it. So I'll just duplicate it and then put it at the back of the song and then make my changes or whatever, and if it sucks, I just delete it. So there's a ton, the, the fun thing about this series that I'm going to do is there's a ton of, like, lost channels or lost patterns. Some of them are really good, um, and I always the, I always save all of my files because I like going back into them after, because uh, there's, uh, there's some gold back there. So that'll be a fun thing to just go back through and see some of these, like, alternate realities where this might have been how the song sounded. Because, man, it, it sucks when you like something, but it's just not gelling. It's not gelling with the track, so you have to take it out. It's like Sophie's Choice. It's like, which child do I save? Do I save Elijah Wood or do I save Macaulay Culkin? What do I do? Well, sometimes that Macaulay Culkin channel tried to push you off a cliff, so you have to let him go. I mean, you just have to do that. The good son. Um, okay, so that's it. I don't know where else to go with this. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, stay tuned. 
the rest of them are gonna get a lot crazier because I'm gonna actually be playing tunes in them. Not that tune. This tune. Woo! Okay, bye everyone. Catch you soon. For some more, uh, developer diary slash workaround slash workthroughs slash quick looks of Nornrad's chiptunes.